Um, Gary and Eva have uh, graciously agreed to come visit with us and share the tales of their visit to Australia and New Zealand. Yes, amazing. Um, and as you, when we get done, as you leave, if you'd like to take an extra sandwich kit with you, that would be fine. Um, otherwise, sit back and enjoy. Thank you for being here. Thanks for thanks for being here. I, I, sometimes I wonder whether I have anything to, interesting to say about some of these trips or not. But Eva and I love to travel, and we love to see different parts of the world. I was talking with one table about some of the things that we have seen in the past were things that, as a little kid, uh, fifth or sixth grade in my geography book, I'd see something, and then to go there and actually look at that and say, wow, look at that. You know, Israel is that way. You, you, you go into Israel and you say, oh, well, that's where Paul made that speech, or this is where Jesus went to synagogue, and those kinds of things. And you, and you uh, just to be able to put those those pictures in your head with together with thinking about the things that you enjoyed um, looking at, talking about, as you as you grew up and uh, we enjoy that and our next trip it was supposed to be in april but they've they postponed it now we're going to egypt and and jordan and some of y'all have been there and i want to see the pyramids and i want to see the sphinx those things were in my history books and i want to stay i want to look at them you know i want to see what that i think that thing really is so uh anyway that's that's uh Part of travel we really enjoy. Uh, this trip is kind of a long time ago. Crystal from the library, whenever she hears that we've been somewhere, she'll call me and she'll say, "Can you get a program?" Crystal's been trying to get me over here since since about March or April of last year. Of course, with COVID and all that, we haven't been able to do that. Uh, so this this is kind of old information, but but it's. Uh, it's still fairly fresh to us because we haven't been anywhere else since then. But uh, Australia was always a place that, uh, Australia and New Zealand was always, were always two places that were intriguing to me and uh, became more intriguing to Eva. And she'll tell you a little bit about some of the connection there a little later, but we, we enjoyed going, going and, and seeing the things. We were there for a month. It's hard to tell you very much of what we did in in the uh, in the time period that we have here today. But we were there for a month, and we traveled all over Australia for two weeks, mostly by by plane and bus. And then we got on a cruise ship and went to New Zealand, and then made various ports of call around New Zealand and saw that beautiful and wonderful country. Australia is. A very interesting place. This this huge country has a population of 26 million. That's not very many. Most of the people live uh, right along here, from Brisbane, Sydney, Melbourne. That little area right there. There's a few people live up here, and then over at Perth, there's a few people. That, the this uh, west coast is all mining. East coast has trees and, and it has more rain and it's a prettier area. And then this whole center is just wilderness. It's just desert. Uh, there's Alice Springs and Alice Springs is, is a very uh, popular place for people to go because it's the center, the center of the outback. And if you ever watched Crocodile Dundee, that's where that's where that movie was filmed. And, and Alice Springs, I could go to Alice Springs, and I believe I could stay there a month and just just look around and, and enjoy it. But the miles are huge in this country, from the north to the south, 2,500 miles; from the east to the west, 3,500 miles. Have a look at this picture. There is Australia, an outline of Australia laid on the United States. 
So here you have a, a country with 26 million people in the, in the square miles, almost the same as the United States, and the population density is just pretty, pretty low. But uh, what a fascinating country, and uh, the people of Australia are awesome. They're the most pleasant, friendly, gregarious people that we've ever been around as far as any of the countries that we've gone to. And people, the people everywhere are, are a lot better than, than you would maybe sometimes think. But Australia, I mean, they grabbed the over of it and you were just like part of the family. And so anyway, that's what we did. Went two, two weeks in Australia. We, we uh, flew from uh, Los Angeles and, and landed in Melbourne. We started in Melbourne. We went along the coast, uh, ended up in uh, Alice Springs, then went to Carnes, which is where the Great Barrier Reef is, and, and uh, you'll see some pictures of that in a little bit. And then we ended up going back to Sydney, and then from Sydney, that's when we went to, to uh, New Zealand. This is our tour group that we travel with, and we always try to give a, give a little uh, uh, boost to them. The company name is Tour Imagination, and uh, the, the lady here in the middle, Audrey, she's the owner of Tour Imagination, and they put together a wonderful trip, and their costs are pretty good. And they're a Christian-based company, so you usually don't have the usually don't have a bunch of wild people. It's less part of your trip. A little more tame like Eva and I. This is, this is the uh, skyline of Melbourne. Melbourne is a very modern city, but it's but the, uh, the original city is based on old English uh, influence of the people that, that settled the country. Australia was settled by uh, by English prisoners. They, they used Australia as their prison. And they, if, you got in, if you got in trouble in England, they'd put you on ship, send you over to Australia. And eventually, the, the people that established the country were prisoners. So I don't have any relatives in Australia, but Eva's English. And so I think maybe some of her relatives were there at one time. But, uh, this is this is Melbourne, and you can see the the old English influence in their churches. And this particular building, I don't know if you've ever heard of the heard of the uh, name Captain Cook. Captain Cook was the original uh, explorer who founded. Found Australia, who found the Hawaiian Islands. He found lots and lots of the of the uh, islands that are out in the in the Pacific Ocean. And Captain Cook was the founder of Australia. And this house is in Melbourne. And the interesting thing about this house: this was his house in England, and he liked it so good he had it taken apart, put it on a ship, brought it to Australia, put it back together. Lots of wildlife there. You saw these white parrots everywhere. Cockatoos. Yeah. Oh yeah, cockatoos. In the southern part of, of Australia is a lot of uh, rainforest type type stuff, and these these ferns were probably 15 feet tall, just huge, huge ferns and and growing in the rainforest. We had a lot of rain while we were there. We were there when the news was talking about all of the fires in Australia, and, and it just it just rained almost every day we were there, and they were so happy to be getting rain. Uh, the fires were not nearly as widespread as the news led you to believe, and it's just like here, if you have a wildfire that's up by 
that's up at Dallas Junction and you, and you have a wildfire that's down by Gary, there's a long ways in between them. And it sounds like a lot of wildfires, but it doesn't cover the, the huge area that you think. But uh, they were really glad to be getting the rain anyway. That country gets very, very little rain. The average rainfall in the outback in Alice Springs is an inch and a half a year. And that's not much. This is the South Coast. Uh, Ocean Drive, is that what they call that? Along there, very, very famous drive along there. And these were the, these rocks sticking up were called the 12 Apostles. We couldn't find 12, but there's, but that's what they called them. And some of the original settlers came into this area, landed on these sandy beaches, and moved, moved on in, inland in, in Australia. But very pretty, very rugged. The south of Australia is also where the farmland is, and this is some of the farmland that we drove through. A lot of the people that come here and work on our farms here during the during the summertime to come from Australia, they would come from from South Australia, and the, the land, the crops, and all of that are very similar to what, what we have here. They, they just have less rain. Another picture, same kind of area. A lot of nice cattle, and then when you got to the center of the country, you had these cattle that looked like they ought to be in a zoo somewhere, because they were just wild. But these, they did a lot of herefords there. The famous eucalyptus trees, there, there are 60 some varieties of eucalyptus trees. And uh, you've probably heard before that the koala bears have to eat eucalyptus. Well, there's kind of a specific eucalyptus that those koalas like, and, and uh, they were similar to, to these, but there's, there's a lot of eucalyptus trees from things that just look like a bush to trees that are 100 feet tall, uh, but all of them had the white peeling bark. Uh, there's a koala. We saw lots of koalas because they, since they've had those fires, those things have come out of the trees during the fires and tried to escape the fire. And then there were people going around that were that were catching them and bringing them to different uh, rehab places. And and uh, but uh, we saw a lot of koalas. It was really hard to ever see their faces. The way yeah. they hang in the tree. And they sleep all the time. It's hard to see with that light back there. That's a, a wallaby down, down there on the ground. A wallaby is just a, a little kangaroo. Something that I had never even heard of. What, what kind of, what did you call these? Blue fairy penguins. Blue fairy penguins. They were little this tall. And these blue fairy penguins dig a burrow and they lay their eggs in the burrow and the little ones grow up in the burrow and every day mom and dad go into the ocean and go out and swim and catch fish and then they come back and regurgitate the fish into the baby penguins. And, you, and we went one night when they were coming back on shore from having been out fishing all day, and you weren't supposed to take any pictures of them, but I, okay, and I, I lied again. That's a herd of them right there. Yeah, we saw thousands and thousands and thousands of those little blue penguins, and, and the sides of these hills were just covered with, with penguin nests, with these little penguins that were wanting their food, and they were all squawking and all making these noise. And how mom and dad ever found their little their little ones in the middle of there? But they did. They just they, there's ten thousand penguins that all look the same, and they just walk up there to the right ones. And it was really interesting to see. Yeah. Yes. What was the reason for them not wanting to be photographed? Yeah. What was the reason? 
I know that because they did in one flash and stuff to disturb them. It yeah. confuses the ones coming back. So yeah. you could take the pictures as long as you didn't have to use flash? Yeah. yeah. And, uh, they, and they had camera police walking around too. So. I've been known to make a U turn in the wrong place too. And, <laughs> and so I had to get a picture of things. Well, I thought there was probably a reason yeah. for that. It's, it it's the flash deal. That just that confuses them. So there's a bunch of little confused pins. No, I can't find the babies. <laughs> they belong here. First place we went after Melbourne is to Alice Springs. Had to fly out there. And it was several hours because it's. It's 1,500 miles from anything. And then I'm gonna let Eva tell a little bit about, about the next couple of pictures from Alice Springs. Since Alice Springs is so far from everywhere else, and the people that live there are on huge ranches that are could be 100 miles apart, all of them, and so we, they have a medical system for the outback that is always manned, and there's always a medical, or maybe even two medical people plus a pilot ready to go to an emergency wherever in that area. And so they have an office, you call in. Don't you picture the couple? Okay, you call in, they figure out where you are, what you need, and they send the doctor to you. Most of these branches have landing strips. And that's how you get your medical care. And in emergency, it's that way. Okay, go on to the next one. This is a quilt that they also have their education system for the outback located, <clears throat> located in Alice Springs. And this quilt, I think that's three panels. You see part of two, two of them and part of a couple more. Every home that had a school or had kids made some a big quilt block depicting something about their home. All right, this is government sponsored education. Every home that has children who can be educated have to set up a school room and a, an aid is provided that lives at your home. And then the teachers, located in Alice Springs, do what well, not only we call it virtual, they've been doing this a lot of time. They also get all the supplies they need at their home. And the teachers either do a virtual conversation with the child, or they come on and they tell what you're gonna do in the morning, and then the aide works the children through it. Sometimes they watch pre-recorded sessions also. It, it was just really fascinating. I didn't realize I would need to know so much about virtual school. <laughs> but they have it set up in Australia and it's on their responsive and their home. Twice a year, they all have to come. Where are they? Where are they come? I mean, that's not probably in Alice Springs, but the whole families come to a central location, could be Melbourne, could be Sydney, and spend like a week. And education is evaluated, all medical needs that are just routine are taken care of during a couple of weeks a year. And other than that, these families are on their homes, see very few people. <coughs> I would almost bet they don't even have television because, <laughs> but anyway, we also saw in Alice Springs that was one of the tracking stations for um, Skylab, when it was originally launched, you can't see a lot of it, but it's still there. It's, it's kind of, try, they try to hide it so you didn't know it was there. But it's, <coughs> it's hard to, hard to imagine how remote this area is. Eva said 100 miles from one ranch to the next. Well, that's, that's close neighbors. Some of them are 300 miles apart. And if, if they get in trouble or they're not, you know, they have some sort of injury or they need to go to school, they just figure on how are we gonna do this with the distances involved. A 
million acre ranch is kind of an average size ranch out there because you only have a sprig of grass every five feet. So for cows to get anything to eat, you have to have a, a lot of uh, a lot of ranch land to be able to handle those. And mostly in that part of the country, they raise cows and uh, the sheep are, are going and done more around the coasts. This is the original founding of Alice Springs was based on this. This was the uh, telegraph station that was established in the late 1800s. They ran telegraph line all the way across the country, all 3,500 miles, and in Alice Springs, they had the main station to be able to go out and do repairs or you know, whatever needed to happen on telegraph, but this was the original telegraph station that, that uh, was at Alice Springs and is what established Alice Springs. A lot went on in that little old town. <laughs> Now here's Eva in our finest Australian outback wear. Flies, flies, flies. You can't, you can't imagine how many flies. And they just were, they didn't bite you, but they were in your nose, they were in your ears, they were in your shirt. And so you had to wear a, a, a hood like that to keep the flies. Off of you, and we were really glad to have those things. It was miserable in his town. Here, he even took a picture of ladies acting. You see, that's and that's uh, just a few. This guy's playing a didgeridoo, and it's just kind of a horn thing that. They make some noises and rhythms out of it. It's, it's something that the Aborigines use for communicating with each other over long distances. Plus, it's, a, it's something that they used for their uh, worship or whatever you might call in, the, in their religious activities. But, uh, we saw a few of the didgeridoos. In Alice Springs, we saw the most Aborigines that we saw of anywhere. And I don't have any pictures of Aborigines because it's it's really kind of, it's kind of rude before you take the pictures. The Aborigines at one time were considered to be like the American Indians were, that they were the pest and they weren't human. And that, that uh, attitude within Australia has only changed within about the last 10 to 20 years and they've given them rights and they've given them some land and they've given them uh, a, a lot of things, you know, that they've allowed them to, to be uh, more involved in the government. Yeah. There has to be like one out of four legislators in the Australian legislature has to be a, an Aboriginal. And uh, so they have, a, they have kind of a new, setting within the people there and and the people respect them much more than they did at one time and uh, but we saw quite a few of them they we didn't see any of them that were dressed up like crocodile or dundee the guy ate the bat you know but the uh, uh but this is this is a one that they used this particular picture was uh taken in the evening after you get dark, the flies would all leave. You never, never saw a fly. But uh, we had, had an evening out in, out in the outback, had a nice dinner, it had, had lamb and kangaroo and all the, all the local <laughs> stuff. And, uh, what did the kangaroo taste like? Pardon me? What did the kangaroo meat taste like? Chicken, uh, kangaroo, yeah, like <laughs> chicken. <laughs> Uh, it's kind of, kind of like beef. It was, it was, I would compare it more with lamb. Yeah. yeah. Now, these are some pictures of driving through the outback, and you can see it just, it just kind of desolate. And I have to go through them pretty fast because they're not. 
showing out really good. There we go. There's a gas station out in the middle. You might see a gas station every couple hundred miles. You better stop when you get when you get there. <laughs> What's your gas prices like? Oh, I don't remember. I think they were like two and three dollars a pint. A pint? All right. Well, they sell it by the liter. Liter. When you leave the U.S., you buy gas by the liter. That's what I'm saying, right? But a little bigger than a pint. A little bit bigger than a pint, but no, no, not no, much. No. No, a liter? A gallon. No, a liter is, is like your bottle of water. <laughs> That's right, Esther. A liter's <laughs> about a quart. The quart? Okay. Yeah. It's a quart. <clears throat> One of the things, if I could go back to Alice Springs and drive around a little bit, I would like to go to some cattle ranches because you can see stuff out in the distance. But when you're on a bus, you go where the bus goes, you know. And, but they did tell us some things about, about raising cattle out there. And this is, all, this is all grazing land, and they would be running cattle on there. Some of those cattle are three and four years old, and they've never seen a human. And they're, it's, a, it's a pretty, they're pretty wild, and it's pretty tough to, to deal with them. So they control their cattle with water. And most of their water is done with drilled water wells and and then they will they will make a water station where there will be a whole bunch of tanks there might be 500 cattle of the water at this particular station and then that water station has a big fence built all the way around it and those cattle come in every day and they water well when it's time to work the cattle or it's time to haul them for to the sale or that sort of thing well they they let the water, let the cattle come to the water, and when they get in there, they close the gate, and then they, and then they have them caught. And after you've worked those cattle, say you've given them their shots and castrated and done, done all the same stuff that we would do with cattle around here. After you've done that, you take the hairy part of the tail and you cut the hair off of, the, off of the tail, and that says this cow's been, been worked. Then the next time you catch them, anybody that has the hair cut off the tail, well then you let him go and you, and you work the ones that still have hair. And then that hair grows back within several months and, and, and you start over with your process. But everything is controlled by water because it might be, it might be 20, 20 miles from one water to the next. And, uh, so they don't have fences, do they? No. no. They just let them no. fend for themselves. I know, but they don't. They don't give them any other food at all. They no, no, because they, they don't give them any other. Food. They don't have any to give them. They don't have anything to no, give them. They don't have anything. You can't grow hay there. I know, but I don't know. They just. They're just on their own. Well, they're not pretty cows either. Uh, they're not pretty cows I can either. <laughs> they wouldn't be very tender. Uh uh. This would be near nearby a water station. There would be a water well down under there somewhere, and then these tanks to catch the water, and then they would run that they would run that water over to to where their their watering uh, tanks were. But this this would be the, the pumping station. They spend a lot of money getting water. When you only have inch and a half a year of rain, what do you? Do. Now this is we we saw very little uh, of the fire, but this is one place in Outback where fire had been through there, and what looked rough before really looks rough now. The trees and shrubbery doesn't look real dense, does it? No, it's not. <laughs> no, I was gonna say that. This is. Anywhere that we travel, we generally have a main guide that is part of your group, and then you hire local guides who live there and they tell you the, the local things. This would this guy would have been one of our local guides, and and I put his picture in here because this is the way an Australian man dresses, all of them. 
some of them might wear brown, but they, but they, that's the way they dress. Uh, just everybody that you see looks like that. We have snakes out there at this. I'm sorry. Any snakes? Snakes, snakes in the? I don't think so. Isn't that strange? I have, I have not ever. Yeah, they have, they have the nastiest snakes on earth, but. Uh, they aren't out in the yard. Uh, well, not where we were. Aaron, what's the weather like? I mean, here, is it warm all the time? No. 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 With they have some seasons. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, we have but, winter. They have summer. Yeah. We were there in the summer. But do February. they stay the snow like that there? No, okay. I don't think so. They, I think they do a little bit in some of the higher elevations on the north east corner. This particular thing is what when you when you were a kid, if you studied geography books. There was a thing called Ayers, A-Y-E-R-S, Ayers Rock. They now call it Uluru because the, uh, the Aborigines said <coughs> Ayers was named after an Englishman, and this is, this is our rock, and we want to call it Uluru. This rock, this picture is taken from probably a mile away. That thing is a mile long, and oh, almost a half mile back this way. And 300 feet tall, and it's basically one rock. And uh, it's a it's a place where the Aborigines uh, went to gather together, went to worship, went to do their whatever Aborigines do to celebrate. There's another picture of it, a different time of day, but it's a big rock. And this is the one that I saw when I was a fifth grader in my geography <laughs> books. Look at that rock. That's a, that's a big rock. Okay, he was the one. He was going to tell you a little bit about this this uh, jewelry. My dad fought in this area in the Philippines in the Pacific Theater during World War II. Well, every soldier had a drawstring bag that had all their personal hygiene items and everything. And so my sisters and I divided all that up. Well, I got the bag. And just before we went to Australia, I guess I didn't do something like that rather than just watch it flutter around the house. In the bottom corner of that bag were these bracelets. They are handmade out of Australian coins by natives in New Guinea. And they are called love tokens or trench art. And so I thought they needed to go back to Australia. They're Australian coins. He was in the Corps of Engineers, and that's on the front, and it has my mother's name on it, says Eloise, and then the coins decrease in size. That one I can't put on, the other one was too small. But it just, it was just so interesting to me that I would have a chance to go to that country and have found those bracelets by accident. <laughs> Did you get to go where your dad was stationed? No. He no. was going around Australia. Oh, okay. No. But, but all oh, those countries down there used Australian money. He, he was in New Guinea. And Philippines, I believe. Yeah. I'll show you some more about that in just a little bit. This is part of Uluru when we got up close to it. Here's some cave uh, hieroglyphics from the Aborigines. Could they read them? Could they tell you the modern ones? Did yeah. they know what was said? Yeah. The guides knew what they said too, but we didn't remember that. Okay, from, from uh, the outback, we went to, to Carnes, and Carnes is where the uh, Great Barrier Reef is. <coughs> and we went out on the Great Barrier, uh, we went out on a sailboat, a big sailboat, and uh, went out to the Great Barrier Reef and put on our wetsuits and, and our uh, snorkels and snorkeled around a little bit. And I'm not going to quit my day job. I have to be kind of a 
deep sea diver. That's hard work. There's one of the people from our tour. It was pretty. There were a lot of, lot of animals, a lot of coral. I'm giving instructions on banana trees, I guess. <laughs> This guy joined us one day for lunch. Lots of lizards. I was telling you earlier, the Australian people, people are so gregarious in lots and lots of places. <coughs> go somewhere to eat, there'll just be a big table. Everybody just sit down and just enjoy each other. This particular, this particular restaurant was on a boat and we sat down and, and uh, visited with these people, had a great time. We ate some prawns, which are actually langoustinos that are, that are very similar to a lobster. There's some wallabies. Edith wants to take that one home. This is a wombat. I've always heard of wombats, but I've never seen a real one. It's like a pig with fur, and they, they dig these big yeah. holes under the ground and burrow around and tear everything up. But that's that's a wombat. That thing's about probably about that long, about that tall. Cassowary bird. Cassowary bird. Australia's the only place where these are and they're mean and they don't kick your teeth out. With the I can see that. And these are the dingo dogs. We had we had this joke in our family. Eve is allergic to cats and she's not a big dog fan. But if you go anywhere where there's a dog, the first place that that dog is going to go is right to her. These dogs are laying on the ground. Eve will walk in front of the fan. This one gets up and starts coming over to her. <laughs> More scenery. This is Sydney, a very modern city. And here's the, uh, the Opera House at Sydney. This was another rainy day, and, and uh, so it's not very clear. I have a more clear one in, in a little bit. We went inside the Opera House and took a tour, and it, it was a, a really big uh, facility. Here's some of the, they had a whole bunch of stages in there in this particular one, uh, practice stage. Some of the English, old English architecture. This was a beautiful old hotel. We went and ate lunch there one day. A lot of English influence on the architecture. <coughs> This particular place, you can see there on the, on the entrance, it says Grace. This is the Grace Hotel, and the Grace Hotel during World War II was the headquarters for the South Pacific Command under General Douglas MacArthur. He was, he was uh, this is where his staff and he would have uh, been headquartered to direct the, the war effort in the South Pacific. And beautiful old hotel. You can see the Art Deco look on the inside. But we enjoyed staying there. They had a lot of history stuff posted on the walls. And uh, I, I'm a reader of World War II stuff, and, and just you could just almost feel these ghosts there. There's another better picture of the, of the uh, Opry House. Of course, that's the most iconic picture of Australia. You see something about Australia, you're gonna see a picture of this place. Right out in the middle of the main harbor. Uh, from this picture, we were on a cruise ship getting ready to leave for New Zealand. And then here's us again with our war bombs. Kind of out of order, isn't it? Yeah, out of order. Okay, New Zealand. Got on the ship and it took it took two days to get to 
See? I love this guy. Never mind. It took many days. Went, went to New Zealand. Along this side of New Zealand are, are the fjords like you would have in the in uh, Norway. Norway, Sweden, and all that. Show you some pictures. <coughs> Here's Dunedin, one of their <coughs> famous cities. If you if you ever happen to see the world's fastest Indian movie, where the guy broke all the speed records, he was from Amber Carville, and I really wanted to go there and see his museum, but I couldn't get there. Christ Church is a, is a uh, important place. Wellington, Taronga, and then Auckland. Those are the places that we went. And during the night, the, the ship would move to the next port, and then we'd get off and take a tour or something the next day. Now, to give you an idea of where they are, when you say the word Australia and New Zealand, you say, yeah, well, you know, those neighbors. 2,500 miles from Australia to New Zealand. And this is 2,500 miles, almost exactly the same distance to get over there. So it's not near as close as you, as you think when you just say the words fast. And then up here, New Guinea, that's where he was dead, was stationed in World War II. Solomon Islands, uh, Guadalcanal, we, we know all those words from World War II, New Caledonia. There was a lot of a uh, lot of World War II fighting that went on here and there. And the, the people, the, the army guys and the military guys that were stationed up in these areas, they would come to Australia for for their R and R. And uh, so you'll find that of, of that era there are a lot of American men that are married to. Australian women that they met when they were when they had uh, time off. There's our ship. This was the Ruby Princess. Ruby. Two weeks after we got off the ship, the name Ruby Princess became real uh, important in the newspapers because it was this ship. Right after we got off, the next group that got on all got coronavirus. They didn't stop them when they got back to port. These people went all over the world and a, a lot of coronavirus was spread off of that ship by the next group that was on, on the ship. So our timing was pretty good to get home. These are part of the fjords, and you can see the you can see the uh, uh, waterfalls and this the water along here was just kind of a narrow channel, and this huge uh, cruise ship went down this channel and saw this beautiful stuff. <clears throat> All the countries that we've been to, uh, I think New Zealand had to be the, pr the prettiest that we've ever been to. Poland is pretty, but New Zealand has a big, because, mainly because New Zealand has so terrible much water and, uh, and everything is just really green. There's some more of the fjords, little fishing village off over here. As we were coming in and out, there were a few fishing trawlers going in and out of there. The number one export of New Zealand is wood and if you look at that picture each one of those are individual logs look at all these logs and that was every port that's the way it looked they were they were taking those logs out of there i think most of them were some variety of pine here's some of the uh, architecture christ church Everywhere you went, there were flowers, and, and we like we like flowers, and, and uh, most of the pictures that Eva takes have flowers. I mean, most of the ones that I take have either some sort of a truck or a car or a tractor. We have botanical gardens here with all these different roses. 
and it was when we were there it would be it would have been the end of fall for them so end of summer uh, yeah end of summer or moving into fall sometimes it was cold <coughs> This is a very typical scene. Anywhere you go in, in New Zealand, you're going to have you're going to see water somewhere, whether it be the ocean or rivers or any of that. And it's very rugged, very hilly, uh, lots of grass. There are more sheep in New Zealand than there are people. There's six million people in New, New Zealand. see some sheep down there in the bottom. These are some typical homes. <coughs> it was a neat, clean, tidy country. People did things kind of right. Streets were clean, everything, everything was, was beautiful and, and fixed up and well kept. These are the jacarunda trees, and they were they were almost bloomed out. We we did get to see a few of them, but boy, you talk about a splash of color. You drive along and you see one of those trees. Here's another one. We went one day uh, in the bus to uh, to a sheep station and uh, drove along the along the edge of the ocean and it was really pretty dry a few little of these little uh, lighthouses like this this would be a sheep fold where they would put their sheep away for the night and they had a demonstration of they had two different kinds of dogs that they used there for the sheep this particular one is like a healer and then they have another one that just looked like a big old floppy black dog, and they and they each had a different kind of a use for uh, for Kevin, for putting these sheep into their pens. Here's a big mud looking thing. When you stop at court, there'd be a line of buses out there. Depending on where you want, where you had, uh, were planning to go for the day, I was was interested to see how many buses were sitting out there. Pretty art deco house. Now we tried to figure out what this, what you do when you come up on this street sign. Well, it says concealed. You should know right there. Must be a dead end street. Dead end or something. You better know where you're going. Okay, you can tell them about this. Or, or where you want to be. Okay, this is the, it's a national park now. It's called the Elms. And it was the, uh, one of the, not original missionary state, stations but the one that lasted it the um call it the church missionary society sent missionaries uh, mr brown and his wife to here, here and this is where they established their mission they lived kind of in cabins with thatched roof for a while very primitive but they made a lot of inroads with the people who lived there and they there was a lot of peace in this area at the time. Also, instead of warring tribes or someone coming from somewhere else that caused problems, this is the front of the house. It stayed, okay, about 18, 1847 is when this started. The original missionaries came in 1829 and they were killed. And this is the new, these were the new guys. Um, so they, Eventually built many buildings on this property, and then they um, in eighteen let's see about eighteen ninety they had so many Australians and English people coming that it 
was not the mission lost its influence. So the Browns bought this area, about six acres. The rest of it was given to the soldiers or whatever to build. It established the town of Charlotte after that. And it stayed in some member of the family until 1999. And a foundation was formed to preserve it. And they have preserved it very well. The native people that were there and are still there are called the Morai, M-O-R-O-R-A-I, I think that's how it's spelled. The Morai people, they look like Hawaiians. And in fact, they're the same group of people. These, those, those people of the South Seas in the 1500s, 1600s, they'd get in a little old canoe and they'd go a thousand miles in a canoe. And they and they'd settle on these different islands, and they're the people who originally went to New Zealand. They found Hawaiian islands, the Solomons, the, the Philippines. They were they were just all over the place. Uh, if you uh, if you watched any Thunder basketball and you saw Stephen Adams, Stephen Stephen Adams was a member of the Morai people, and uh, that's. That's a very predominant uh, group of people there. They're very involved in the community. They're hardworking folks. They, they get in the middle of what needs to happen. They're a major part of the government. But the, these people originally went to, uh, to serve those Morai people and learned how to speak their language and all that. This is some car wood carvings. The more I people, I, I have a meeting house here in the man, but I'll show you. It has some more of that. This is a kiwi bird. It's a stuffed one. When you hear the word kiwi uh, associated with New Zealand, I mean, that's that, everything is kiwi this, kiwi that. The kiwi fruit was called something different. They decided to call it kiwi because it just had a name that was more identifiable, but that's what a kiwi bird looks like. And it only comes out of its burrow at night and it digs around in the rocks for bugs. I think I could do a better job of getting a, a mascot for my country, but it's okay. Now here, speaking of kiwis, we went to a kiwi, uh, kiwi farm and here I'm down under the kiwi vines. See them, see them all growing there. The kiwi vines grow at a level that's about head high for me. And the people that pick the kiwis are usually smaller uh, Filipinos, that kind of thing. And they, they just walk under there with their bag and they pull those kiwi fruits off into the bag. Kiwis are all harvested at the same time. They were getting ready to harvest them they were harvesting a few already, but they're all harvested at the same time, and then they're kept at 33, at 33 degrees. They have huge, huge refrigerated warehouses, and they keep them at 33 degrees, and when they're ready to ripen a kiwi, you just let it warm up, and in a couple of days, then it's going to be edible ripe. So if you ever buy a kiwi and you can't figure out how to get that thing right, you just set it out a couple of days because the 33 degrees is the key to keeping that thing uh, from uh, from getting over right. They'll keep, they'll keep them all year at 33 degrees. You can't imagine how many kiwis there were. The, key, the, the, plant, the female plants that you pick off of were head height and they were level. But then the male plants, the ones that go to 45 degree yeah. up to the top, those are the male plants and they put those up higher so that they can pollinate those females that are down lower. This is Auckland, skyline there. There were no cities that were really very big in New Zealand. Auckland was the biggest, but doesn't have a very big population. Railroad station. 
some kind of a cool old building. And Church of Church of England, Anglican influence of the churches was was uh, pretty strong. Here's the port. Again, that's all fun. And this is one of those boats those guys would go all over the South Seas in. You've probably seen them on TV or a whole bunch of them with, with paddles. Be in there and just to go on like everything. This was a meeting house, a Morai meeting house. And uh, I wish we could see the detail better, but it is incredible. Carved teak and different woods, and just a, just a beautiful, beautiful building inside and out. And this is where they would meet together to make their tribe decisions and that sort of thing. That white package that's there in front of Eva, when you went to the restaurant, that was your carryout wrapped in white paper and it was fish and chips. Every place you go, you get fish and chips down there. Boy, they had some good, good places too. But wrapped in that white paper, that was just so interesting for them to hand you this bundle. We got, on the, got back on the ship and we were headed back to Australia. Uh, we bought a tour to be able to go tour the ship. And it was pretty interesting. Got to see all the all the different stuff. Got to meet the doctor. The next the next week was going to have a boatload of COVID people. <laughs> <laughs> but this is this is the uh, up the bridge where they're controlling the ship. This guy's driving the boat. He's got a joystick over there in his right hand, and, and he's the man driving. This is our group. We all sat together for our, for our dinners and, and enjoyed doing that. Two servers, if you've ever been on a cruise, you know how important your, your servers are, and we had some good ones. And that's the end of it. So, anybody have any questions? Well, you know, probably yeah. the major religion there. The Anglican. Major religion, Anglican. Is, uh, do they have denominations like we do? Oh yeah, we. Said, I saw some. I saw some Baptist churches in in uh, New Zealand. Australia is not very heavily religious. Not very much at all. If you start reading some statistics, there, there aren't a lot. Well, and now a major part of the population in Australia is Asian. Yeah, 25% of, of Australia is is of Chinese descent, and the people from China to Australia that they back and forth visiting each other all the time. When we got on the when we got on the uh, on the airplane come home, they were not letting any Chinese get on any of the airplanes because they they had started figuring out this COVID deal and they were, they were keeping them all from moving around. What is the crime rate there? Crime rate? I don't Do know. Do they have crime? Oh, I'm sure. Yeah. I'm sure the, I, I, don't think it, I don't think it's very high, but I, I don't know. They also did not allow, well, I won't say, never mind, that's all. <laughs> One of the interesting things about New Zealand is there are no cross-country roads. If you're going to drive your own car to go from one town or city to the other, you're driving the perimeter of the island. There's no, because it is all mountains yeah. and so because rugged, you can't just cut across. And if you're going from the South Island to the North Island, you have to catch a ferry. And, and up 
on the North Island, the further north we got, the warmer it was, and on the south end where we saw, that was in Australia, but on the south end, it was very, very cool because it's closer to Antarctica. So it, it just made sense. So you had to pack for two seasons. How do you make beam your electricity? The electricity, it's just, it just 220, the same as England or? There's no auto wells. Oh, More. I don't know how, I don't know how they generate it. I would think it would have to be hydroelectric. Is the, is the gas high that you use in the automobile? They, well, I, think, I don't know. I'm well, I think, sure it was high. I think I tried to take a picture. I always try to look for that and get a picture of a station because you can see it. That's what Esther and I were arguing about a minute ago. And she's right. It's like 250 a quart. 250 it's a bigger a quart. It's called oh, Royal. Royal. It's bigger than um, a gallon. There's more than a gallon in each. Yeah. yeah. It's liter. It's in your foreign countries, you buy all your gas by the liter. Yeah. Yeah. And it's too much. Yeah. Because they don't have any. They don't have any. There's, there's no, there's a little bit of natural gas in Australia, but not very much. There's no oil. Oh, the pictures, it didn't look like it was very handicapped. No. No. <laughs> no. So if anybody was having a problem with water, they couldn't make that trip. Yeah. If you want to. You want to travel and you need and you need uh, handicapped access forget it go to israel sometime being handicapped there's no way you got to walk on all these rocks and okay. stuff and Yeah. 